Annabelle really draws a crowd. This is a, a very interesting crowd because everybody's running around hugging each other. I don't know what it is, but I think it has to do with the person who's speaking tonight. Um, I'm Billy Chen, the president of the Architectural League, and we would like to thank the Irwin S. Channon School of Architecture at the Cooper Union and Elizabeth O'Donnell and Nader Tarani for hosting us and jointly sponsoring this lecture. Annabelle is currently working on a contemporary art institute called LUMA in the industrial ruins of Arles, a renovation in addition to the Museum of Contemporary Art in San Diego, and a school in Zambia for the 14 Plus Foundation. She has a monograph entitled uh, Seldorf Architects Portfolio and Projects, which will be published by Fiden and comes out in April. And this is brand new news. She has been awarded the New York City AIA Medal of Honor. So there's a lovely phrase which originates from the gemstone trade of the first water. The quality of diamonds is assessed by their clarity. The 1753 edition of Chambers Encyclopedia states, the first water in diamonds means the greatest purity and perfection of their complexion, which ought to be that of the clearest drop of water. So the most valuable diamonds were called of the first water. And I would say that Annabelle Seldorf is an architect and a woman of the first water. Her work and her persona is one of absolute clarity and an elegant restraint, leavened with the jalapenos of a very wicked sense of humor. Todd and I visited her renovation of the original museum building at the Clark. The exquisite beauty of what she did there is like water. Everything feels right, calm and fresh and simple, like water. But we know that a hell, a lot, hell of a lot of design and rigor was needed to create that simple, perfect clarity. And those jalapenos reveal their fiery presence in beautifully lit and classically proportioned rooms with walls painted a deep purple, palest lavender, and oxblood. Just to remind you that you shouldn't get too comfortable or take her work for granted. I would also like to add that she has a whistle that can take down a tree. <laughs> I know. So tonight, Annabelle will talk about her work at the two ends of the spectrum, recycling of garbage and the presentation of art, the Sunset Park Material Recovery Facility and the David Werner Gallery. Annabelle. Welcome, all of you here. Did we really pay this many people to come here? <laughs> I've been to so many lectures in this um, August lecture hall, and when the Architectural League asked me, invited me to come and show our work, um, I began to shake. Um, I'm still shaking a little bit. Uh, it's such an honor for me to be here tonight and such a humbling experience that all of you came. So without further ado, I'm gonna get started, and when I get too nervous, I'll just speak German. I do that fairly well, by the way. <laughs> so I just thought to begin with, I would tell you just a tiny little bit about um, who we are and where we started. And that was in 1988, when my friend and then partner, Wilvin Van Kampen, and I started a small office called uh, Seldorf Van Kampen. We did a kitchen renovation. It was awesome. We then did a kitchen and a bathroom, and that was even better. And we swiftly moved into, into renovations of kitchens, bathrooms, and living rooms. For a number of years, we did a lot of interior renovations, mostly residential, um, but that was great. 
It was fantastic because not only was it real work, but we learned so much doing it. Wilvin uh, decided in 1990 to take a full-time teaching position and I continued on my own. And, and other projects started coming in. There was, in 1990, my first art gallery, Michael Werner on 21 East 67th Street. And that's a project that I feel like I learned so much from because I had an amazing client with a wonderful eye who, for the most part, left me alone and said, you just do it. And that gave him the opportunity to be very mad if things weren't exactly how he wanted them. But he was never really mad because I knew every last eighth inch uh, of the space. From there, other galleries followed, um, among other projects. And what you see here is David Swerner's first gallery. You'll hear a lot more about David Swerner, so I'll move on. Then, in the late 90s, we re uh, were commissioned to do a project, um, our first ground-up construction. And truthfully, it wasn't ground-up construction because we kept the elevator shaft and therefore could say it was a renovation. But again, this is a beautiful building on the Upper East Side where um, many constraints, Landmark and other, were existed. Uh, notably, though, it was an, another art gallery. Then in the late 90s, again, almost at the same time, we were um, asked to do the architecture for what is today the Neue Galerie Museum for German and Austrian Art by Ronald Lauder. It was going to be a very minor renovation. It lasted for about four years and um, really meant creating a new institution. The building is a career in Hastings building from 1914 um, and used to be a mansion. So turning this museum into this house into a museum was a very tall order and um, it was a really interesting project because we had to learn about how would people flow in, how would people circulate in a building of this kind. It was pivotal uh, as a project for us because it was truly the first public project. And I will say that weeks after it opened, I remember walking by a person who was visiting the museum, and I noticed that they were looking at details, that they were looking at the restoration, things that I thought I had basically done for myself. And they noticed what a beautiful place it was. And I will say that is why we're doing what we're doing, and, um, and we're still doing it. <laughs> so what was interesting, of course, also was that the building was built in 1914, and the exhibits in the building um, are all about early modernist art round about the same time. Today, when you go, you see, find the building just as beautifully attended as it was in the very early days, and um, we're proud to have been a part of it. Fast forward to 2015, uh, 16, isn't it? The office is now 65 people, and I have to four fantastic partners, Sarah Lopergolo, um, Lisa Green, Julie Hauschfen, and Bill Bigelow, who are all here tonight. There really isn't anything that I could do if it wasn't for the four of them, because the kind of work we do, the kind of work that Billy just described, isn't the work of a single person. And in fact, I was talking with a friend over here about a project that's on the boards, and I realized it is, of course, true. I feel like I only have a very, very small part of it, but I'm still pushing it all uphill. <laughs> um, so tonight, I want to talk about two projects, uh, David Swerner's gallery on 20th Street in Manhattan and Sims Municipal Recycling Facility in Brooklyn in Sunset Park. That project, the recycling facility, is located in Sunset Park, as I just said, and you can see on the map that it's uh, this little pier, it's an 11-acre pier to be precise, looking out on the Gowanus Bay. It's a city-owned property and at one time served as a police evidence parking lot, which was a rather creepy experience the first time I went there because there were bullet holes in the parked cars. 
Um, but it's a beautiful sight, and you can see here that you're looking out on Manhattan on, in the northern direction and the Statue of Liberty in a western direction. And the first time that we went to see it, we were fascinated by the beauty of it and the sort of raw beauty of the industrial architecture around. Today, unfortunately, they've taken those beautiful water tanks off the skyline and they no longer serve us. But suffice it to say that this was a very small competition and um, the project is held by a public-private, um, is a public-private partnership. We were hired after having won this competition um, by Sims Metal Management to design the facility. And by the time that we were hired, actually all of almost all of the permits and the sort of relationships with the community had been cleared away so the work could start in earnest. This project, of course, was also very important for Mayor Bloomberg and his initiative to, to revive the working waterfront in Brooklyn. And um, you can see him here lending his hand. The first thing to do when we began with the project was to understand what a recycling facility is. It turns out there isn't a vast amount of architecturally worthy precedent here, but what we learned is that there is um, three major components to a recycling facility. There is a so-called tipping building, which in this case also uh, is on the other side uh, accessible to, to barges from the water side, there is a processing building, and this is basically a simple building with a vast amount of very sophisticated equipment, including optical sorters and, and um, transporting material uh, to its destination. And then there is a bale building where the cube material is stored until such time that it's picked up by trucks or rails or back to barges. So with these basic elements, we understood that organizing the site in some ways was predetermined. It became very clear that on this 11-acre pier, the tipping building had to be to the south in order to be accessible for barges on the adjacent southern edge. The processing building had to be internally connected and uh, therefore adjacent. The bale building, in turn, had to be adjacent to the uh, processing building and had to also be accessible to the outside so that trucks could come and pick up things. So those three elements didn't exactly have to sit to one another in the shape in which they are now, um, but almost more importantly was then to create a relationship to a component on the project that is um, not always a given. There's an education center and we combined it with an administration center um, in one building. We saw right away that there was an opportunity to take advantage of this incredible view and thought this would be a great place for people to work and this would be a great place for kids to play and understand what recycling is. So. The first order of business then had to be uh, how to do circulation on the site. It was, became very clear very quickly that access to the site could really only happen in one area. That meant that three kinds of different traffic had to come in. That means a pedestrian path outlined here in red, a pedestrian and bicycle path outlined here in red, then secondly, uh, civilian cars and school buses that drop kids off in the in the education center and people parking uh, along who are coming from afar parking in the tree-lined parking lot I might add um, and then the third path of circulation would be uh, trucks and trailer trucks delivering and dropping off things the fourth one the rail uh, enters separately to the south of that, and therefore rarely would be in 
in contradiction to the rest of the traffic. But just to illustrate, this is what happens on the site. There's a scale building, trucks come in, get weighed coming in, they get weighed coming out. And so in the end, it was very much a way to organize the site by way of creating a master plan and think about how would you grow, how, how would the facility grow into its own activity. And we work very closely with SIMS to understand, to make sure not only that we understood how things would function, but also to try out different schemes. And they liked the idea that, um, that the education center and the admin building would come together. And, um, and so this was the organization that we agreed upon. It's evident from this aerial photo that only about 30% of the site is covered by building. That means there's a lot of leftover space, which is basically dedicated to truck traffic, to vehicular traffic, etc., that I just outlined. But on the northwest edge, there was an opportunity to create green space. And we needed it, too, for stormwater runoff. And so uh, we placed this kind of green space uh, next to the ad admin education center, thinking that we could connect people to nature that way. And anyway, you get the point, nature. <laughs> nature, <laughs> water. Um, so it became also very clear very quickly that with the requirements that the facility had, a pre-engineered building was the way to go. Um, we worked with a company called Nucor, and we actually visited Nucor in Indiana, um, to help us understand how, this, how the structure would best be, be organized. And they were very kind working with us in turn to, to use the rigid frame in such a way that it actually sits on the outside of the, of the building envelope. The reason why we thought this was important to do is because we all admire Prouvé very much and we thought we follow suit. Um, not only that, though, it seemed to us that by having the structure expressed on the outside of the building, we would be able to proportion the building, to give the building scale, to give it rhythm, and to sort of introduce a theme that throughout the design of the, of the facility was something that was very important to us because um, the buildings are so huge that when you drew a little person in the drawing, they just were so much smaller than, than anything that we had done before. So the exercise of giving scale, proportion, and making people feel like people in this facility was something that um, I would say was one of the highest priorities. And in fact, this move raising the, the roof of the tipping building just a little bit so that it could slope to the south and be a very good, um, good receiver for the solar panels that were installed on that roof with a bridge coming across, and I'll be talking about that uh, briefly later. We were able to install a kind of series of courtyards. And, and I think that was really very helpful because by parceling spaces into different size outdoor rooms, so to speak, um, one did feel that you could comprehend the overall space and that there was a unity to it all and a kind of um, an opportunity to understand the space. The tipping building turns out to also be an e-buff. EBUF always gives me pause because I can't remember what it means, but I trained. And it means enclosed barge unloading facility. Yes. <laughs> I've only trained this for like the last seven years or so. Um, but what the meaning of this word is, what you see in the picture, is that there was a requirement that barges could come in under roof to unload. And 
It wasn't really until we were fully immersed in, in the design of the facility that we realized what an immense spatial opportunity this was. What a beautiful thing to have maybe half of the roof basically hanging over the water and sort of creating this gate into the city. And I still am kind of in awe of that. It's enormous and it's fantastic to see uh, to see the barges come in and see how this this is all in action. But I think as an architectural theme, incorporating the water as such a powerful element coming out of the out of the pier is something um, that I enjoy very much. Uh, so there you see it from a further distance, and it's really interesting to me time and time again to see the different um, elevations that aren't necessarily ready for consumption unless you're very far away or something. Um, the education and uh, administration building is of course much, much smaller in scale. It's about 20,000 square feet, still not such a small building, but um, it serves two purposes. On the ground floor there is the administration, which is not only offices for, for for the company, but it's also locker rooms and showers for the people working in the facility. And there is a lunch room right in the middle of the building um, with a view and a terrace to the outside and with this amazing view that I've already shown you. There it is. Um, on the second floor is the education center, a really beautiful, playful full installation of educational material by a company called Whirlwind. Um, they designed how children could learn and experience the history of materials and the history of recycling. And I will say, having worked on this for a long time, not the installation, but the facility, I still feel every time I go there, there's new things to learn about materials and why we should not think of them as garbage, but instead as commodities that are valuable and um, sort of bring it to the forefront of our minds that uh, this is a really very important thing for the city. There's classrooms facing west, and these classrooms um, double function as community spaces. This was something that was incredibly important to the community. I know um, that it was also very important for the client who had made a promise to the community that, that this space would be available. And um, I love the fact that it is often full of people and parties are held there and people are swinging from the roof and, oh, no, 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 it's not like that. But um, there, part of the didactic concept, of course, was also to provide a viewing platform so that people could experience recycling in action. And it's really quite something. Um, but in order to access the viewing, com the viewing platform and to do it from the education center, we decided to build a bridge but this bridge had to be about 30 feet above, uh, up in the air, so that trucks and cranes could go underneath uh, without, without banging their heads against the bridge. That bridge was a very exciting uh, moment for us because when we presented to PDC, they looked at us and said, you guys, you have your trusses wrong. And it turned out, in fact, that we did have them drawn a little bit wrong. But thanks for PDC. Um, but all joking aside, having this bridge element and, uh, and the stair that goes up to a th very tall third floor was something that we felt was really important because there's this vertical element and the horizontal element of the, of the bridge. And um, it's really fun to go across it and experience the view, maybe a little bit like what you experience when you're on the High Line and you see the city in a totally different context. Kids like it and adults alike. And this is what it looks like from the viewing platform. So in my mind, this is an incredibly generous gesture that 
since um, provided and it's a real pleasure to see all these kids, school kids, screaming about and there is a competition between who is louder, the processing equipment or the kids. Now eventually there was the question about what was this, what was the material, what was this thing going to look like. We've already talked a little bit about the structure, but um, I cannot remember that there was even a minute when I thought that this could be anything other than one single material. And of course, my colleagues in the office wholeheartedly agreed it could only be one thing, Febrel. For months and months, the buzzword in the office. Febrel is a corrugated galvalume panel, and um, we did an amazing amount of research. You know what architects do when it comes to finding just that right material. Um, anyway, we found it and we installed it simply everywhere. It's a beautiful light gray, uh, like I said, corrugated material where light, nature, water is reflected and every, every weather condition, every sunshine, every um, moment of the day makes it look a little bit different and there is a kind of calming simplicity about um, all buildings being enveloped in the same in the same material uh, that I enjoy very much. On to more serious things, uh, maybe a little bit backward in time, but what you see here is the the raising of the of the pier. And while, of course, I would like to take credit for um, intelligence and uh, and um, attitude, but it was really the client who decided early on in the project that the FEMA um, ground level required was going to be too low considering uh, the rising tides. And indeed, they raised the pier by four feet using crushed glass and uh, Second Avenue mole rock. I thought that was very funny, but anyway, um, there it is. It, brought the level up four feet and very luckily they did that because in 2012 when Hurricane Sandy hit um, all adjacent piers and 29th Street uh, were flooded with water very high and a great deal of damage was done but effectively nothing happened um, here at Sims and we could merrily continue building. Of course a recycling facility makes you think about whatever, what all the sustainable strategies could be that you could employ. And like I already mentioned, on the tipping building is one of the largest solar panel array in New York City. And we're also extremely proud to witness the uh, first commercial scale wind turbine in New York City. From time to time, I think back on the early days of when we started thinking about the design, started planning it, um, the frenzy that went into, we have to present to PDC, let's do some renderings. And I look at the facility today and I think it's actually really pretty similar. Well, the roof was sloped in the opposite direction, but aside from that, it's really very close. One might say, okay, the design was done there and then, 2012 or whenever we, whatever the year was when we submitted it, probably 2011. Um, but no, we were very lucky. We had a client who was supportive of our desire to stay with the project and to stay on. And they were interested in our opinion all the way through to the end. And when I look at the details and how the project is cohesive today, I think it's in no small part that we had the opportunity to participate in millions, not thousands, not hundreds, millions of decisions about where would we place certain openings, how does the exhaust meet the Fabrel, um, where are minor doors and uh, major doors, and 
some of the decisions I was a part of, the majority of the decision everybody in the office took responsibility for, and it was really a group of a group of people in the office, and I'm immensely proud of it, who worked to hold the party line, so to speak. But um, it's not about holding the party line. It really is paying attention to absolutely everything all the time and to not veer away from, from the big picture. And the big picture was really to create a place, a public place, a place that makes the city better um, and give it our best to respect the client's needs, to understand that the building would really only come to life once it was taken over by the trucks and the people and, um, and the recyclables. For me, there is a great deal of poetry in all that rational thinking. How it goes together, who who wins over who, I never quite know. Um, but I know that that's our work. And, and like I said, uh, paying attention all the time. And I guess that's really what life is all about, isn't it? So from here, quickly on to um, David Swerner. Um, David is one of my oldest friends, like myself. He's from Cologne, um, although we didn't know each other then. And um, for the 20 plus years that we've known each other, there's, I think, hardly ever been a year when we haven't worked together. What you're seeing here is multiple galleries, one next to the other um, on 19th Street, and we renovated one after the other, one year after the other. And um, it's always been fun, and on the upside of working together so much is that you can pretty much finish each other's sentences, which is not always good, but in our case, I think that was worked very much to our advantage. So when David, in 2008 or so, decided to buy a building on um, 20th Street in Manhattan, in, in Chelsea, between 10th and 11th Avenues, um, we were, of course, very excited for him to build this magnificent new gallery, and we realized quickly that the garage really would never serve the purposes that it needed, and so um, it had to be demolished. With that came a 30,000 square foot new building that's dedicated both to, to gallery, but also to, to the work inside the art world, the, all the background uh, work that has to go on. But it became very clear very quickly that the key thing that David wanted was a 65 by 65 foot by 18 foot high um, exhibition space. And it had to be daylit. And so it became a kind of heart in the middle of the building. And the rest of the, the, rest of the spaces had to go around it in this L shape. They went up five, they go up five floors, and I'll explain a little bit how, how it all goes together. So to the northwest, in the northwest corner is that large square exhibition space, which gives a great deal of opportunity and flexibility to David um, and his team for the exhibitions that they have. There is a series of showrooms, one of them skylit, the other one just completely internal. And then there is the ver all important vertical circulation, uh, passenger elevator and an open stair that goes five stories up through the building and has a big skylight on top of it. Finally, important is also a big freight elevator with a loading dock out to the street. Now, all of that planning seems perfectly simple and logical, and it does in retrospect, but that building is so tight um, that when I look at the spaces today, it seems they're all but inevitable. In section, you can see that we worked with these um, tall sawtooth northern skylights, and as a matter of fact, the Cooper Union studio skylights have been very much um, the, the inspiration for the shape and the, and the orientation of them. And then there is a kind of narrow tower-like structure that wraps around um, the south and east 
east, yes, east, um, on five floors. From an urban point of view, this was a mid-block condition, and it was very clear that we had to hold that street wall. Um, but we were also dealing with a neighborhood that is rapidly changing. There is more and more residential building that is part and parcel of the success of the High Line. Um, so we wanted to think about a building that would at once be part of the neighborhood and part of the sort of urban attitude, but at the same time also could stand out. And we did a lot of exercises like what to do with this facade. It could be this, it could be that, and it could look like this. And when David was very encouraging about using uh, cast-in-place concrete, we all jumped up and down and said, what a great idea. Um, needless to say, very quickly we realized there is not much precedent of board form concrete in New York City, and for good reason. Now, I will not elaborate why, but I'm here to tell the story. Be that as it may, we had to learn a lot, and we had wonderful collaborators, uh, Reg Hoff, who probably some of you know, and Steve Zimmerman were our trusted cohorts in this, and we made them come and do all these mock-ups with us and explain to us how, how do you place the board form, and then there were endless um, mock-ups with different widths of of boards and different species of boards, different lengths of boards. And along with that came drawings showing joints here and there. And um, we were really, really trying to give Ando Concrete a run for his money. As it turned out, that is a doing concrete over five floors is unbelievably stressful because with every pore, you're sort of anxiously awaiting whether one pore looks relatively like the next pore. And um, I want to say we got lucky. But in fact, I don't think it's really luck. I think, again, it was the entire team working tirelessly to simply adhere to this is how it's done, this is how we must do it, and sort of going to site and making sure that everything was done properly. And, um, and in the end, I think it looks pretty good. So part of this facade exercise was also to think about what does the building do on the, on the street, we wanted it to be open, to be welcoming, to, to bring people in to see the exhibitions and, and practically bring the exhibitions to the outside. And then on the, on the upper floors, there is an exhibition space on the second floor. Um, we wanted daylight to come in in a gentle and, and sort of elegant way and picking up what is present on either side of the building, a sort of punched window and so on and so forth. So this is looking into the building and we thought that it was a good idea and interesting also to see a little bit of what was beyond, maybe understand a little bit of what the show um, that was on right now was, looks like, um, but not too much, so that there is that in-between zone where people are curious to come in and feel welcome. But materially, we also thought that it would be very nice to juxtapose the hard and, and sort of um, edgy concrete with a teak window and a teak storefront. And I still think that that's a very elegant choice. And um, we worked very closely with David on finding the just the exact right material, I mean the exact right teak, and again, working on the boards and so on and so forth. So a big massive uh, concrete facade is a nice thing, but if it's just a facade, it's perhaps not that interesting. In fact, it's a concrete building, so um, we thought, the concrete has to find an expression on the inside. And it quite naturally would find that expression in the vertical five-story atrium space of the, of the stair. 
And staircases are an interesting thing. Five stories tall is really a very tall space. And having it lined with the same board for, form concrete was a sort of unequivocal decision that David had to get his head around. Um, but then we waxed on poetic. Le Corbusier, La Tourette, beautiful thin stair, and, and everybody was on board very quickly. Needless to say, it's not La Tourette, but what we did learn from, from La Tourette is a very, very thin section stale, stair. And um, I have to thank Steve de Simone for supporting us on making it very thin. I should say Steve de Simone and Julie, who pushed very hard to get that done. So the railing around the, the stair opening is basically a steel and glass railing, and so it's a very pure experience as you're walking up the building. And for the most part, people are just walking up to the second floor because the upper floors are, are more private. Um, but in some ways, uh, one gets the experience of, this, of the totality of the stair from, from every angle. On the ground floor, back on the ground floor, I now want to talk a little bit about the materiality. It's a gallery, so guess what? There are not a lot of materials. Walls, white. Daylight from above, big dimension. Um, we are here in that very large space that I already talked about, and a great deal of effort went into thinking about how one would experience that space, how you enter it from coming in from the street, um, and making sure that there was a great deal of flexibility because different kinds of art um, are shown here, obviously. This is Richard Serra's installation that was um, the first time that the space was completely without, free of partitions and completely in one whole thing and it was really something else. Um, or there were a series of paintings by Ad Reinhardt that sort of equally made you feel overwhelmed. The simple concrete floor, the flexibility of the space, um, and the kind of maybe respect or restraint uh, to sort of step back and let the art do its thing is something that I think uh, is very important here. Now, on the second floor, we changed materials just a little bit. The ceilings are less high. There is a wide oak uh, plank floor on this entire floor. And scale becomes more modulated, almost domestic. And again, we understand and, and know the kinds of exhibitions that would take place here, but I feel immensely gratified to see different exhibitions and to think every time the space looks a little bit different, but it's just there to support the work that is shown. In these particular pictures, it's not so drastically different, but last month uh, the gallery had a Morandi show, and it was simply beautiful. Um, so we're very proud of these elegantly proportioned spaces and the layering of the daylight that comes in from the street, etc. This is uh, one of the. This is the third kind of daylight. There is daylight um, in the big room through the sawtooth skylight. There is daylight that comes in uh, from from the windows on the side, as you've just seen, and then the third. Uh, Skylight is a kind of ley light that modulates and gives you a very different kind of feel of feel and experience of daylight. But the building isn't just about showing and viewing exhibitions. It's also about the people who work there. And it was a tremendous pleasure to, to work with David and his staff on how did everybody want their workspace to be. Um, what you see here is the working research library slash lunchroom. Um, and I myself, whenever I stop by there, I'm, I'm very happy if they ask me to sort of come and have a cup of coffee. Uh, it's a nice place because, again, daylight is, is of the order and it's a very sort of communal experience. 
the offices are very simple, very straightforward. People talk to each other, and, um, and it's a very simple, rational space. There was a great view of the Hudson River one day, um, but the Foster Building has taken that away. So just enjoy the picture. <laughs> it's also uh, the first lead gold uh, commercial art gallery, um, as far as I know. Nobody else has made that claim. But just quickly to say that we had a really fantastic team. Atelier 10 and Altieri Seaborn and Weber uh, worked very closely with us to sort of put everything together from high performance mechanical service to natural ventilation to green roofs to uh, bicycle storage and, and all, of, all of that. And I will say that that's not very easy because the building was very, very tightly designed and to find room to uh, get to get the insulation in in the right place, to do the thermal bridging and all of that, I think was truly a learning experience for all of us, but um, we were pleased to do it. And speaking of green roofs, we were able to um, get our friend Pete Udolf to work with us on the roof, and that was that much nicer because we're in such close proximity to the High Line. So getting his intelligence and his sort of sense of nature and beauty is, was very special. So in closing about David, um, David's gallery, I think I want to talk for just one second why we called the gallery Common Ground. And I've been torturing myself, what am I going to say? Common Ground because buildings were built at the same time, yes. Um, they're both new construction, yes. Lisa told me that wasn't good enough. <laughs> I think what's really, what really makes the buildings hang together is not only <laughs> that we worked on them, um, but that they're both places for people. They're both for the public. And they represent as such um, maybe our desire to make people feel welcome to do something that is so simple that they don't feel impeded by it, but so where there is never, never too little, but never too much. And that's a sort of interesting tension in my mind that you can only hold if you pay attention to absolutely every part all the time. And in the end, I think it's the people the art, the recyclables, that make our architecture come to life and be sort of fully enacted. And um, having feeling that you really just contributed something um, is tremendous to me. It's working with the people who need the buildings, who know the buildings, who know what they need. And um, yeah, OK. I'm really coming to an end now, I know. It's almost 45 minutes. Um, I was going to tell you about all these other buildings, all these other fantastic projects that we're doing. Um, but I am running out of time, so I just quickly want to point you to, to an apartment condo building that we recently built on Lafayette and Bond Street, number 10 Bond Street, that we're mighty proud of. Um, and because it's so close by, I can actually just send you to go and take a look for yourself. Then uh, Billy had already mentioned the uh, Contemporary Museum in San Diego, which is actually in La Jolla. And um, again, a really great project of an existing museum with a wonderful collection. And we're adding more than double uh, the gallery space that they currently have. And um, we're in the permit phase and hope that we get going very soon. Super exciting project. And I encourage everybody to come to La Jolla, but only after we're done. <laughs> then there is a project that's very dear to everybody's heart in the office. Um, it's a primary school in, in Zambia. Um, we're working very closely with somebody who pro a lot of you know here in the office, Joe Mizzi, um, and the Plus 14 Foundation. And 
it's a really interesting experience to learn about local um, building techniques and um, and how the school works and how to bring community in and uh, how to make systems come home so that children uh, don't have to travel 40 minutes to get to school, but that they find together with their teachers and together with the community, a community garden, and all of that is a part of that. Um, and it's just a super exciting project, and you'll hear more about it when we're a little further along. So in closing, there's just one more project that is very important to us, and it's an art center called Luma Arl in Arl in the south of France. And if you are seeing a building that looks an awful lot like a Frank Gehry building, it's not my building, no, no, no. <laughs> Uh, that is true. Frank Gehry is building a new building. It's just south of, um, of the historical center of Arles, which is really incredibly beautiful with all the Roman ruins, and uh, sits atop or on the edge of a 25-acre uh, old rail yard buildings. We are responsible for bringing to life all the old rail yard buildings. And they're fantastically beautiful because they're sort of late 19th century um, industrial architecture in France. There's very little left of them, so effectively we're sort of bringing them back to life. Um, but it's a lot of fun and um, a really magnificent project, and I hope that you'll get to see it another time. Thanks. not so personal, but it's sort of personal. So you've designed installations as varied as the Stella Show at the Whitney um, to an exhibition of Vanini glass by Scarpa, um, which traveled from Venice to the Met. How do you approach and subsume yourself to, to such different kinds of subjects? Well, it's like everything else. You start by learning about it. And then you do a whole lot of exploration to understand um, Well, you learn, you think, you learn, you think. Um, and then you have an idea. And then you illustrate that idea. And then you talk about that idea. And that seems like a fair balance between rational understanding and sort of intuitive, intuitive um, bias, maybe. Um, some of it has to do with experience, too, is I look at a lot of art, and I love art. So, um, so then you think about, if you wanted to look at something, what, what would be the best experience to, to see it at? And, and a big, I mean, with the Stella exhibition, for example, that was tremendously interesting because he's an absolutely brilliant man who knows, obviously, <laughs> quite a bit more about his work than I ever can. Um, but, but his way of looking at it is so different from the way any of us could possibly experience. So um, it was a back and forth, and um, so much of it had to do with the fact that he respected our approach, um, that he could tinker with it. And then we would go like, no, 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 you can't do that. And he was just like, yes, I can. Uh, so that was fun, it was great. So did he act as your, was he really the client or was? The Whitney, the client. Uh, Whitney was the client, but um, but the Whitney did the same thing. They were. Um, it was like this. They were like, no, 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 no. Yes, 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 yes. No, 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 no. <laughs> and then we were like. <laughs> it was great. Um, so you say you look at a lot of art. Um, I always, Todd and I always play this game whenever we go into a gallery or a museum and we say, what's the thing that you would steal? 
I play that game all the time. So I want to know, in, in the entire world, you could go someplace and you could steal something. <laughs> you think I'm going to tell you? No, You'll no, get there no. first. <laughs> what, what, art piece, what artwork would you steal? Well, there are way too many. Well, of the many that you would steal. <laughs> well, something very valuable that I could wear on my finger, maybe? <laughs> no, I honestly don't know. I mean, it just depends on where you are. When you're in Rome, you think it's got to be just some incredible Roman sculpture. Then you go to Greece and you say, no, that's way better. Um, <laughs> go to the Rijksmuseum and it could only be a Rembrandt. Um, I take a Donald Judd, Judd or two. Uh, so, no, I can't tell you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, could you tell us about um, your furniture company, Vika, and its history? So, um, I, I talked a little bit earlier about starting do with apartment renovations. And part and parcel of doing apartment renovations was that people have ugly furniture. And, and then if you're lucky, they ask you to help them find some new furniture. And um, this is a very long time ago, and I was very young, and I thought, sure, no problem, that's easy. I'll just make some furniture for you. First one, bad news, sofa, uncomfortable, we so on and so every, forth. All of us do that. Right. So by the, by the fifth time you think, now I know it. It's time to start a furniture company. It wasn't exactly like that, but a little bit like that. And it's also where I am from. My father was an architect, but more than anything, he was a designer. And his mother had actually started a company um, just after the war uh, that was called Vika. And in my youthful enthusiasm, I thought I will revive that company that had closed in the early 70s. Um, and I asked my father, who was at, alive at the time, to help me make, or rather help me with drawings of furniture that he had designed in the 60s and 70s. And it's actually really very beautiful, and it still is part of our collection. And um, so that gave me the idea that that's what I wanted to do. And um, I foisted it on everybody who would let me. Have you ever designed something that you hate and why? <laughs> the short answer, why would I do that? <laughs> um, no, I have done things that I thought were just not as clear as I had intended them to be. And then I find myself starting like, but in plan, it was really, really good. Um, and um, I'm not going to tell you what it was. OK, two secrets. We don't know what she would steal, and we don't know what she designed that she hated. <laughs> um, Maybe there are other people in the audience who would like to ask questions and see if they can get answers out of Anne. <laughs> Over my dead body. <laughs> really? Uh, somebody's pointing. That's. Uh, the question is, did we ever, um, do we ever have to or want to work with artists? Yes. The answer is yes. We work with artists all the time. Many of my best friends are artists. Um, I'm lucky and happy to say that some of them are in the audience. Um, and it's a great pleasure when you do, if you think alike, and if you have the opportunity to, to think about work in a truly collaborative spirit, um, there's nothing better. 
Hi. Uh, I've actually been to 10 Bond Street. My friend was the project manager with uh, New Line Construction. Beautiful lines. I'm so glad I got to see uh, the building, though I don't think I'll ever actually personally know somebody who lives there. So that was great. Uh, I love Bond Street. I live nearby. The beautiful architecture on Bond Street is fantastic. How did you come up with the idea of glazed terracotta tiles for the facade? Um, glazed terracotta is a fantastic material. It's abundantly present in, in New York City and in many cities in, in the country. Um, and we've started using terracotta maybe 10 years ago or so with the first building, um, with the first building on 19th Street where we used it. I've always been fascinated with it because it's an old material and in a way it creates a kind of grounding, um, grounding presence, if, if you will. Um, and it has, the, it has the ability to be molded, so you can actually play around with shapes. Um, when our thinking oftentimes is very rational, there is real pleasure in, in the shaping of the material and in the color that you can achieve with the glazes. Um, there's one company in America that's called Boston Valley, and um, but they it's have in, in Buffalo. Maybe. It is in Buffalo. That's right. Um, <laughs> it's cold up there. Um, they're called Boston Valley in Buffalo, um, and no, they're in Rochester. Fly to Buffalo. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> she she's difficult. <laughs> Anyway, um, it seemed like just the right material. This, this particular site was subject to landmarks review, and we wanted to do a very open, very modern building. Um, and there's a huge amount of sort of that rusty color brick along Lafayette Street. And so to negotiate the cast iron um, tradition that is on one side of the street, together with the brick, the Terracotta seemed like a beautiful material that could stand on its own two feet. Next question, because I don't see anybody else in the line. Uh, I was just curious about Fibrel. You mentioned you said it's corrugated, but is it like a cement panel? Oh, no, no. It's, it's uh, an aluminum. It's, it's galvalume. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Thank you. Um, my name is Jake Cooney. I was beautiful uh, presentation. The, such a elegant the word human and warm, the materials, the scale. I'm not an architect, but my wife is. Um, I'm a human, though, and I often say to her this. I often say there's no place for me in this building or in this city or in Florida. You know, it's. Uh, Florida, I can relate yeah, to. Just this sort of sense of alienation. So. Um, my, my question to you is um, what you spoke about experiences and um, intuition balanced with the rational sense of uh, controlled awareness about every step. What, what influenced you growing up and, um, uh, you know, I, I can, the, the stereotype would be the control and the of design would come from the German school, but what, what sort of uh, what sort of aesthetic warmth and elegance influenced you in Cologne growing up? Um, I, I think this is an interesting question because indeed I grew up in later post-war Germany. Um, Cologne, where I come from, was just about completely destroyed in the Second World War. And when it was rebuilt in a fairly haphazard way, beauty and warmth were not the words that came to mind. Having said that, though, Cologne is also home to one of the most spectacular um, Gothic cathedrals that where everything has to do with beauty of scale, um, influx of fantastic light. Um, it's a city that's thousands of years old, 
and um, where the Romans left traces of, of the aqueducts and so on. Um, there are Romanesque churches that are incredibly beautiful. So it's a very rich culture that we come from. And people nowadays think Bauhaus, right angles, no, no room for human beings. <laughs> Not really true. Think Gesamtkunstwerk. Think about art and architecture and, and the, the decorative arts coming together in a sort of larger, um, with a larger idea about how people can live together well and how they can be inspired and interested. And I think that is a little bit the tradition that I come from, although um, I learned a great deal since I've come here. I've been in New York for 34 years. Thank you. Okay. If is, there, is it time for a drink? There are no more questions. <laughs> Annabelle has said it's time for a drink. So thank you very much. Thank you.